Good evening and welcome. Today I have the privilege of uh, introducing an old friend of mine and somebody whose work I admire very much. Alvio Maria Quartaroni was born in a small village in northern Italy in 1952. Although his parents had no formal education, Alvio excelled in mathematics and was admitted to study in the University at Pavia, Italy, where he became the first student of the famous numerical analyst Franco Brezzi and spent 10 years in Brezzi's research group. In 1986, Quartaroni took a professorship at the University of Brescia in Italy and a few years later at the Politecnico in Milan. But Quartaroni also attracted the attention of us here in the University of Minnesota. Well, I wasn't here then, but others were. And uh, in 1990, he accepted a job here. He took a leave from Milan, and he assumed the position of professor of mathematics at the University of Minnesota, and at the same time as a fellow of the Minnesota Supercomputer Institute, where he was put in charge of a research group of four people. Unfortunately for us, he did all too good a job of running the research group, and the word got out. And two years later, he was offered the position of the head of CRS4, which is a supercomputer institute in Sardinia, where he was in charge of a research group of 90 researchers. And he took the opportunity to return to Italy and to his family. And then six years later, Switzerland got in the act, and they offered him the position of professor and director of the chair of modeling and scientific computation at EPFL, the well-known uh, Polytechnical Institute in Milan. Quateroni accepted the position at Lausanne, but at the same time, he kept his position as a leader of a large group in the Politecnico of Milan. So that's Lausanne and Milan. Those are in different countries. And so for the last 10 years, he's directed a center of modeling and scientific computing on Milan on Monday and Tuesday. Then on Wednesday, he gets in the train and takes the four-hour trip across the Alps, switches languages from Italian to French, and completes the week as the head of the center in Lausanne. Just this kind of travel, the supervision of large research groups and uh, students and postdocs in both places, the raising of a great deal of uh, grant funds to support all those, it would be enough to exhaust almost anybody I know. But not Alfio, who's kept up an excellent and extremely productive research program. He's the author of over 200 papers, 20 textbooks and research uh, monographs, he served on the editorial board of about 20 journals. He's given many distinguished lectures, including a plenary talk in the 2006 International Congress of Mathematicians. In 2004, he was inducted into the Italian Academy of Sciences. Alvio not only publishes about mathematical modeling and scientific computation, he puts them into action. I'm sure that we'll see several examples of that in tonight's talk, but I can't fail to mention his work with the uh, racing yacht Alinghi that shocked the sailing world when it won the America's Cup for Switzerland in 2003 and then in the next edition in 2007. And they're preparing for another. The University of Trieste recognized his work, so not only is he a mathematician, but he has an honorary degree in naval engineering. So it's with great pleasure that I introduce to you an old friend and a brilliant computational mathematician, Alfio Quartaroni. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Arnold, for this uh, very nice introduction. It's a great pleasure and a privilege to be here this evening. And uh, I will uh, give you some uh, examples on how mathematics can be used for solving some problems uh, that uh, are uh, not only interesting for, interesting for, uh, for academicians, say. Um, I'd like to start with an Italian uh, uh, whose name is Galileo Galilei. Uh, and Galileo uh, made very fundamental contributions to uh, sciences, not only mathematics. But one thing I would like to mention here is uh, uh, one of his uh, famous metaphor uh, that he actually used to defend the work of scientists from, from the religious authorities, from the Pope at that time. Uh, he wrote that nature is a book written in the language of mathematics. And if we cannot understand that language, we'll be doomed to wonder about as if in a dark labyrinth. Uh, and, and this expresses our sense that uh, uh, nature's truths are, are imposed on us somehow. 
uh, that they are already imprinted in the world, and uh, he underlines the key role played by mathematics in expressing those, those truths. Um, of course, it's very easy to find examples from nature where we can somehow identify, the, recognize the presence of mathematics. There are hundreds and thousands and millions of examples. I will just take one. And, uh, uh, and, and these are three different flowers, say, and, uh, and, and they, they grow um, with uh, very uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, shapes or uh, laws, say. Maybe they are not conscious about that, uh, but somehow you can recognize that uh, there is a kind of very fundamental mathematical property that can be uh, uh, used to explain this growth. Uh, so let me talk about uh, the uh, Fibonacci numbers. I think Fibonacci numbers are very well known. And uh, uh, you have uh, uh, numbers that can be generated by this very simple law. Fn plus 2 is equal to Fn plus 1 plus Fn. So you start from 1, say, and then uh, from another one. So you have two numbers. This is uh, F1 and this is F2. And the next number is the sum of the two former numbers. So now it's 1 plus 1, which is 2. And the next one is 3 because 3 is the sum of 1 plus 2. And then it's 5 and so on and so forth. And you can continue to generate uh, infinitely many numbers, uh, natural numbers. And uh, when you take the ratio between uh, two subsequent numbers, say Fn plus 1 divided by Fn, you see that this number tends to a very specific number, which is uh, uh, 1.6180 and so on and so forth, say. And this is uh, known as being the golden section. Now, the golden section explains um, the uh, way many uh, monuments uh, in, the, uh, in the history has been built up and explains the ratio between different parts of those monuments. So it's very uh, still uh, well used in, uh, in uh, architectural design, uh, but uh, you can also uh, see it as being uh, uh, responsible for the growth of those flowers, say. Uh, so let me, uh, let me just try to uh, see if uh, you can see what's happening here. What you see on the left is the uh, purple daisy. And what you see on the right is its mathematical model. Uh, you can uh, give very simple rules and very simple a very simple algorithm to predict the growth of, of, this, uh, uh, of this daisy. So what you see on the right hand side is the uh, mathematical daisy, say. And uh, you'll see that at the very end, uh, while it's a dynamical process, you start from a seed, which is called a stamen, and then you let it grow, and uh, every seed is generated uh, at a regular distance from the previous one, uh, at, and you take a, a, a specific angle, a constant angle, and you allow it to, to the seed to, uh, grow, to expand radially with a, with, a given, with a given rate. So what you end up with is a representation of a geometrical figure which should resemble the original one. Now, what is somehow surprising is the fact that this constant angle is related to these uh, Fibonacci numbers uh, through this golden section. Uh, and actually, when you try to modify it, I'm sorry for the language, but this is only the picture that counts. When you try to modify this uh, um, Fibonacci number with go this golden section, even by a little amount, uh, uh, you end up with a completely different kind of, uh, of daisy, like this one uh, with only one uh, tenth of error, say, on the angle, or this one, uh, or, or, or this one. This is the right one, and then again, okay. Here is an error which is of the order 5%, and you end up with a completely different kind of picture, dip different, completely different kind of flower. And, uh, and so on and so forth. So what is the, um, what is the explanation here? Well, the, uh, it's not really an explanation, it's just an observation. The fact that this Fibonacci number, or this Fibonacci limit, say, is behind uh, the law of growth of this flower. And actually, uh, the optimal growth, or the, uh, uh, the, the, the Fibonacci number, is associated with the fact that uh, this flower uh, is uh, uh, the different seeds are going to occupy uh, the um, um, 
highest possible volume, namely the density is maximized when you pick up the right, the right number, say, the right Fibonacci number. So it's a simple example that shows that uh, somehow, unexpectedly, a simple mathematical uh, um, um, ingredient uh, can explain uh, um, complex uh, uh, natural phenomena. And, and this is the model. The only active zone is the center, which is called the apex. Uh, every new seed is rotated by a constant angle with respect to the previously born seed. And this is where the Fibonacci number enters in the scene. And once they were born, seeds rotate radially with constant speed towards the exterior. And uh, by so doing, you recover this dynamical picture that we have seen before and, uh, and, and, and what uh, uh, is resembling a, a physical or natural phenomenon, say. Of course, Galileo did not only give uh, this, uh, uh, um, made this remark on, uh, on, on the nature that can be read in terms of mathematics, he proposed a method to analyze things. And uh, this method is pretty much on the basis of the modern, I would say, mathematical modeling of uh, not only of nature, as we'll see. So uh, Galileo talked about sensate experiences, which means meaningful experiences. You have to observe a phenomenon and they use right mathematical measures, measuring the data correctly, and by induction, and this is the analytical step, you formulate a theoretical hypothesis of a given phenomenon, say. Uh, but once you have this hypothesis, you have to verify that it's, uh, it's correct, it's reproducing the reality in a, in a correct manner. So uh, you, you have to go through another step, which is the deductive step. And uh, here is where you use mathematical syllogism, Say. So you need necessary demonstration, which means necessary proofs, uh, mathematical proofs. You have to find out factual consequences, and this is the rational step of science. You have to use the mathematical reasoning, uh, or logical reasoning, uh, in order to uh, uh, prove uh, uh, your theoretical hypothesis, say. And uh, then you have to set up experiments um, to verify that the hypothesis is correct, actually, it's reproducing the, the reality, and, uh, and on the basis of these experiments, you can either accept the hypothesis or uh, uh, contest it, refuse it. And, uh, and, and then you, have to, uh, you can end up with a low or, or a new hypothesis set. And uh, this is the, what can be, caused, can be called the synthetic period of the compositive period, say. Uh, the way you pass from uh, the theoretical hypothesis to the formulation of the final law. Um, so everything is based on, 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 on sound mathematical uh, steps, say, and this is a very synthetic representation of the previous uh, paradigm, say. You have from one side the reality, and from the other side, it's uh, uh, representation, say. So reality and representation of the reality. And the way you go from the representation to reality is through science, you need arguments, factual arguments, you need proofs, you need, you need uh, 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 logic uh, reasoning, uh, the way you, uh, go from reality to its representation is by metaphysics. And uh, you like to state an isomorphism or a specularity between the, these two words. So modeling is exactly that. Modeling is the way you try to represent the reality by mathematical equations, say, and, uh, and then uh, you have to end up with some reasoning showing that this representation is actually correct and is uh, more than correct, actually, is universal. Uh, so what is mathematical modeling? Uh, you start from a problem. It could be a problem in, uh, let's say, aerodynamics. You see an aircraft here, or a sail design, or you see a patient. Uh, you start from a problem which is, an, uh, the, uh, which is occupying the center of your scene, say. And uh, starting from this problem, you have data that you have to measure, and you have to set up a mathematical model. So what is a mathematical model? A mathematical model is a description in terms of mathematical objects, let's say equations, of the reality. Now, this is a very complex stuff in the sense that mathematical models require a geometrical model. You need to represent the shapes of your object. It could be a sail of an aircraft or a ventricle, say. And uh, when you have this geometric representation, you have to end up with laws, with basic principles. Uh, laws can be translated into equations. What is a law? Well, for instance, you want to say that the conservation, you have conservation of uh, mass and momentum around the aircraft. This is a law that you translate in terms of 
mathematical equations. Now, these equations are often too complicated to be solved by paper and, uh, and, and pencil. So uh, there is no uh, closed solution, an analytical solution, a solution that you can write down, like when, for instance, you try to solve uh, an algebraic equation of second order. Um, so um, what you need is another model, which is a numerical model, uh, which could be useful uh, for a computer, say. So roughly speaking, uh, the mathematical equations are very often in infinite dimensions. You need an infinite numbers of data of information to reproduce reality, say. But infinite is too much even for big supercomputers. So you have to end up with a model which has a finite number of unknowns. This is why you have to go to the infinite dimension to the finite dimension through numerical models. Then you can use your computer solving your equation, visualizing the results, and try to see if you have been working properly. And here you have two steps. The first step is that you have to see that your numerical model, your computer model, say, is close enough to the uh, mathematical equations. This is the verification step. But then you have another step. You have to see if your mathematical model uh, in a whole is close enough to the reality. And this is where you use experiments to compare with. Experiments can be experiments in the laboratory, or you uh, compare with uh, results from the literature, or results in vivo when you talk about medicines. So this is a kind of global paradigm for, uh, for mathematical models. So let me see the example, uh, first example on our aircraft. We start from an aircraft, for a picture of an aircraft. This is the very early stage. Uh, you have to realize a geometrical model. In that case, uh, this is a real aircraft. It's the Falcon 50, which is still in use. And uh, you have to use, you see, very simple uh, geometrical objects like triangles to cover the surface. And this is not the end of the story. Then you have to extrude this two-dimensional object to three-dimensional objects because you want to solve the flow equations around the body, but this is just an example. Okay, so this is a geometrical model. Then you have to set up equations, the famous basic principles, and, uh, and, and then uh, once you have these equations and you know how to solve these equations, you end up with pictures like this. This is the aircraft, and this is a map of colors. You have different colors. You go from blue to red. Blue is the minimum and red is the maximum. So these colors refer to the value of the velocity of every single particle of air on the surface, on the skin of the airplane. So blue is the minimum, actually this is a stagnation point with zero velocity, and red on the wings is the maximum. So this is a calculation that you make by solving your equations which express the conservation of mass and the conservation of forces or momentum, say. Um, and, uh, and this is an example from aerodynamics. So Galileo, but this is just a remark, in 1614 made an experiment and uh, he then stated that air uh, is not uh, uh, weightless. It does weigh, uh, even, even though, sorry, even though uh, it's much lighter than water, about 760 times uh, lighter than water. Of course, if, uh, if air uh, didn't have a weight, you would not have a density. If you don't have a density, you can't create lift, and the airplanes would not, would not fly, right? Um, so how to go from the uh, particular case to the general case? This is the uh, synthetic step, or the uh, deduction step. Uh, this is a completely different airfoil. This is the X29, experimental airfoil. This is geometrical representation, and this is the uh, numerical simulation. You see here the uh, trajectories or particles of air which are diverted, uh, which are perturbed when they encounter the, the, the wings. Uh, and uh, so you see the vorticity which is created and also, and again, you see the pressure that is created on the, uh, that is formed on the, on the skin of the, of the airplane. So uh, this calculation requires about seven millions of unknowns. Uh, so we move from the infinite dimension to the finite dimension uh, because uh, you need a finite dimensional problem, you want to solve it. Uh, on a computer, but uh, the number of, of unknowns is, qu is quite big, actually. So it's finite dimensional, but, but still quite big. Um, now, uh, 
this is just an example to illustrate the idea of going from reality to the numerical simulation through a geometrical model. Now, I will uh, 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 give several examples in different fields. Uh, the first one is in, in environment. And uh, this is uh, uh, the Venice Lagoon in Italy. Here is the city of Venice. This is the Adriatic Sea. And what you see on the left-hand side is the growth of tides. Um, so the dark blue means that water is becoming deeper, and light blue it means that the tidal is going back. And you see the different islands in the lagoon, which are resurrecting uh, from, the, from, the, from, the, from the water, say, during this phase. And on the right-hand side, what you see is the diffusion of a pollutant, say. Uh, we are simulating here an accidental release of, of pollutant uh, from, a, from an oil tank, uh, which is passing from that area. You see at the beginning, you have red. You have a spot of red, which means that the concentration is maximum. And then under the action of the tidal, uh, of the tides, uh, this is diffusing uh, and transporting in the different parts of the lagoon. So with this, with this approach, what you can do is to predict the outcome of, a, of an accident, say, and to see uh, how this uh, uh, pollutant is going to uh, dis diffuse and disperse and, and the, the amount of concentration that the value concentration that you'll have in different areas, say, on the different field. Again, Galileo has something to say here because in, uh, in his famous uh, dialogue uh, um, on the two chief world systems in 1632, uh, Galileo gave, I guess, for the first time, a theory of, uh, of tides. Uh, this is a, another example. This is the Colosseum. Uh, we are still in Italy for the time being. Uh, this is uh, uh, a reproduction of the Colosseum by by a geometrical model, use uh, as many as uh, 107,000 isahedra, simple three-dimensional structures to reproduce the Colosseum. And once you have this, you can, for instance, simulate the propagation of an impulse, which is due to a, an accident, or you may also simulate a seismic wave uh, over time. So you see blue means no displacements, no deformation, while uh, if you have deformation, you have different colors, and again, red is the maximum and, and blue is the minimum. So you can predict the way uh, an accident could uh, uh, deform uh, and damage uh, the structure of such an old uh, building as, uh, as the Colosseum. Uh, this time, there are no fluids involved. It's just elastic waves propagating in a media, say. Uh, I will talk basically on mathematical models for medicine. And, uh, and here, um, our interest uh, is to uh, try to simulate what is happening in our circulatory system. I mean, we are made of a heart, and then we have a major artery, which is the aorta, very big, and then you have many other arteries, let's say hundreds of other big arteries, and then you have uh, very small vessels, which are called capillaries, and we have several billions of capillaries in our heart. And then you have the venous system. And this is a closed system. Uh, you start from the heart, and you, uh, uh, of course, you diffuse and propagate blood everywhere. So um, if uh, uh, ideally you would like to solve the problem uh, on the old uh, vessels, uh, which is uh, virtually impossible because it's too, it's too big. Uh, so what can you do? You can try to specify your interest, for instance, to the local circulation. The local circulation is the one between uh, the heart and the lungs to oxygenate blood, say, or you go even further down to a single vessel, and there you start caring about the details, and there you have uh, uh, the red cells, the white cells, and the platelets, uh, which are floating on a liquid which is called plasma. So ideally, you should try to use mathematical tools to describe these mechanisms, the, the interaction between these different particles, say, and uh, this can be done. But you can also try to end up with a kind of homogenized structure, thinking that blood is really a fluid and using the uh, equations of fluid dynamics to describe blood. Um, what do you do in, the pra in practical terms? Well, you start from a real patient. You take, for instance, magnetic resonance or, 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 or computer tomography, and you create a bunch of slides of uh, its artery. Here, you're interested in the carotid artery, which is one of um, 
the most critical arteries for the development of thickening, of atherosclerotic thickening. Um, so uh, you start from this artery and you have to reconstruct it from uh, different slices. This is the basic information that you have from the patient. Now the first thing is that you try to trace profiles uh, of the different, uh, uh, of the perimeter, say, of the, of the different sections. And uh, here we use uh, what is called segmentation. And then uh, you have simple, simple points that you put here on the basis of these simple points, you can reconstruct the old geometry. Those, this is the first step, the reconstruction of the geometry of a real artery, of a real patient, say. And then you can, uh, you see, you have this geometry which has been reconstructed. And then you have to go to the uh, final dimension, try to reproduce a phenomenon which, uh, is, uh, which has an infinite number of uh, unknowns by a phenomenon which can be described in funny terms. So you need, again, a triangulation for your artery, covering your artery by small triangles, and uh, hopefully having a good representation of that. And you start from here to simulate what is going on at the interior of your artery. Right? So you have to simulate the blood in the artery. So it's a fluid in a, in a, in a vessel, say, uh, more or less like the fluid in the, in the Venice Lagoon, unless than here you have boundaries. So uh, this is an example of the simulation that you may have. Uh, you see the carotid artery. Uh, this is the, uh, actually it's horizontal, but it should be vertical. So this is the main branch, and it bifurcates in the neck, and one branch, is bringing blood to our brain, and uh, the other is bringing blood to the, our facial muscles. And, and, and here what you see is the uh, flow field uh, on the different sections. So this little spot is describing a single heartbeat. So this is the systolic phase, and this is the diastolic phase. This is a single heartbeat, one second, roughly speaking. And correspondingly, you see the picture of the flow field. Uh, this is the uh, velocity profile at different sections. Why do you study that? Because you want to see the way blood flow behaves in an artery. You want to see the way blood flow exert uh, pressure or forces on, uh, on the internal surface, on the endothelium, say. Uh, and medical doctors have discovered that there is a correlation between a certain behavior of distress, it's called the shear stress, the force acting on the, on the endothelium, and uh, the atherosclerosis this thickening or the narrowing of the arteries, say. So this is why you are so interested in developing mathematical tools to uh, reproduce this behavior in a quantitative terms, say. So this is an example. But uh, arteries are very complex uh, structures, and in particular, they are not rigid. Uh, hopefully, they deform under the action of the heartbeat. So what you see here is just a section of the artery, a longitudinal section, and you see two things. You see the flow field at the interior of the artery. You have different colors which uh, provide us with the intensity of the velocity field. Then you have the arrows uh, of the velocity vector. And then you have the deformation of the wall, of the arterial wall. Now, to solve such a problem, you have to account for blood flow propagation and also for the deformation of the solid material, which is, which is, the, uh, which is the vessel wall. Um, So um, this is not only, you see, computer graphics. Um, you, 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 you have to know that there are equations behind that. These are the basic principles. See, and uh, sorry. Uh, it was too scary, maybe. All right. And uh, what we are writing down here in mathematical terms uh, um, uh, is uh, uh, the fact that uh, you have equations for the fluid where you conserve the momentum and the mass. And then you have the, the equations for the structure. The structure is the vessel wall that deforms. And this is an kind of elastodynamic uh, law of deformation. And besides, we have the geometry that is changing. And this is a further unknown that you have to account for. And all these systems are, are related to one another. And this is why you have these red terms. The red terms are the terms that, tells you that tell you that the, the different systems are, are coupled are coupled together. So this is a mathematical system that you should solve. And, uh, and, and this was too difficult for Galileo, actually, because at that time, concept of energy 
or also differential calculus are, were, were not available yet. Um, but this is the system that you should solve if you want to end up with the results that I've been showing before. Now, uh, once you have this system to describe blood flow, you can make different uses of that. This is just one example. Uh, I'm talking about aneurysms and cerebral aneurysms. Uh, these are lesions on cerebral vessels uh, which are characterized by a bulge of the vessel wall. And, uh, and they may be subject to rupture, and uh, very often they are almost always, they are asymptomatic. You, you don't feel it. I mean, you don't know that you have them. And so it's very difficult to detect them. You really have to look for them. And, uh, and, uh, and, and this is why we're trying to understand uh, if there are some common, um, how to say, mathematical behavior behind the risk of rupture. Um, what you see here is a picture of the brain uh, seen from uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the bottom, and this is the circle of Willis. It's a kind of polygon of arteries which are there to dispatch blood to the brain, and the blood is coming from the carotid artery that, that I've shown before. Uh, so you may develop, uh, I mean, this system can develop, can develop uh, aneurysms, and this is uh, one example. You see this is the carotid artery, and this is the aneurysm, this one that you see here. So the first thing to do is start from, uh, starting from radiological data and trying to end up with these pictures. These are not the pictures that you have from clinical data, say you have to reconstruct them. And uh, once you have them, you, try, you can try to see how to classify them from the geometrical viewpoint uh, so that you have different pictures and try to identify them uh, in, in a similar class according to some quantitative criteria. Once you have this, uh, you can make the simulation, and these are particle, uh, this is the particle dynamics in this aneurysm, and uh, in particular what you see is what hap what's happening in the heartbeat, and uh, uh, once you know this uh, flow field, uh, what you can do, for instance, is computing the stresses or the forces that are acting on uh, the different uh, parts of, of these aneurysms. Uh, Again, you see different colors. Red is maximum, blue is minimum. So um, on the ground of this uh, data, or more precisely results, uh, uh, you can see which are the parts of the aneurysm which are more sensitive to rupture because they are supporting the highest loads. And again, you can try to uh, classify different geometrical shapes in terms of the risk for rupture, say. Um, so this is one example. And this is another example, this is the myocardium. This is a totally different kind of mathematics because uh, you are solving a propagation phenomena, you are solving uh, the propagation of electrical uh, way uh, in, uh, in the myocardium, myocardium, in the heart, say. And, uh, and this shows that reality is very complex because you don't on, we don't have only fluids. You have, of course, blood in the ventricles. You have also the electrical field, and also you have the deformation of... Uh, of, uh, of, of the walls. So you have uh, fluid dynamics, uh, electric equations or Maxwell equations, say, and then you have, uh, you have structural dynamics for, uh, for, um, for, the, for the deformation. And, and, and this, is, uh, this shows you that uh, uh, nowadays when you have to face complex problems, very often is a kind of multi-physical problem. So you have different physical ingredients behind that. So, so far we have seen what's happening locally. But the system is integrated together, and uh, indeed what you should try to go to do is to go from the local to the global uh, view. And uh, this means uh, that you should be able to simulate what's happening everywhere in our system, in our body, which is impossible because there are no computers around which could be able to treat them. So you have to play with mathematics to reduce the problem in a, in a clever way. And what we did here is to use uh, we'll see it again then, uh, we, to use uh, uh, three-dimensional models as those that we have seen before for uh, investigating the carotid bifurcation or, uh, or the coronary, and then going down to a system of 1D network of uh, the major, accounting for the major arteries, the red, and the major vessels, there are about 100, where you use one-dimensional models, and which are much less, which are much cheaper, say, to solve, and going further down to the level of capillaries, the green area, say, uh, where you use zero-dimensional models, which means models uh, uh, where you only account for the time changes and not 
no longer for the space change. So you are alternating 3D with 1D when it's 0D, and by so doing, you can be able to reconstruct the whole flow field in the old body. Again, this is a way to use mathematical modeling to simplify nature or physics, which otherwise would be too complex to simulate. So the second or the third say part is mathematical sport, uh, mathematical models for sport, and we'll give you a few examples here. Uh, one is Formula One, uh, and uh, this is just to give you an idea. This is not by us, by the way. This is the only computation that I'm showing that is not from us. So it's giving you the idea of the complexity of the flow dynamics behind these cars. And this explains why the major teams now have hundreds of engineers and mathematicians working full time on developing and using mathematical models to simulate the, the, um, uh, the aerodynamics say. Um, this is something that we did actually for the last Olympic Games. Uh, this is a swimmer and, uh, and this is his uh, mathematical reconstruction, uh, geometrical reconstruction say, and this is uh, uh, this uh, mathematical simulation of the swimmer. Uh, we compute the flow field around it, uh, around the swimmer, and uh, here the purpose was to uh, have a precise description of the stresses of forces acting on his body uh, because uh, you can in this way um, design new swimsuits which are capable of uh, uh, reacting positively to the different distribution of forces on the body. So the aim is to develop new swimsuits which are capable in particular to uh, accelerate the transition between the laminar flow and the turbulent flow. These are complex, complex say concept, uh, uh, because in that case you can reduce the viscous stresses induced by the, uh, the turbulent, turbulent flows. So there's a lot of activity on those kind of things uh, nowadays, and this is a to totally different kind of thing. This is, uh, this is an Olympic rowing, uh, and this is uh, the cover of a major uh, um, scientific journal, and this is a simulation made by us, actually, what you see on the background is the, simul the numerical simulation, which is uh, overlapped with the real stuff. These are four, uh, four uh, rowers. Uh, and uh, we used it, used the simulation to compute different forms of the hull in order to optimize the stability and uh, actually to be more precise to uh, minimize the uh, waves uh, which are produced horizontally, which dissipate almost 30% of the total energy induced by the rowers. Um, and then now uh, we conclude this uh, a talk by, by, by uh, giving a brief review on uh, what we did for the America's Cup. Um, just a few words about the America's Cup. Uh, this is the oldest uh, sport trophy uh, nowadays. Uh, the first race uh, uh, was in 1851 in England around the Isle of, of Wyatt, and America is actually the name uh, of the first winner yacht. This is America, right? And, uh, of course, it, it was an American uh, uh, yacht. And since then, uh, since then uh, the, the, the cup is called America's Cup. Uh, then this was held by USA teams, different kind of USA teams, of course, for as many as 132 years, uh, until 1983, where the Australia 2 team uh, won. And they actually they had a great idea. They used, for the first time, an aerodynamic concept, and they put winglets. We'll see winglets. Uh, then. Um, so they put winglets on the, on, on, on the bulb, and uh, in spite of the fact that their, their crew was not that great, uh, they, their, their boat was so fast that nobody else could compete. So they won in 1983, and then New Zealand Black Magic dominated the uh, two editions of 1995 and 2000, and Alinghi, Alinghi won uh, the last two editions, the one in March 2003 and on July 2007, and this is actually the first Alinghi, the Swiss 65, that won the edition of, uh, of March 2003. You can see the difference now between the boats, the way they've been evolving over the years, say. And, uh, and these are the major components of, of, a, of an America's Club boat. Uh, there are several pieces which are reproduced here. Uh, you have the hull, which is about 24, 25 meters long, uh, where sailors sit or stay, say. And uh, uh, then you have the keel, which is this uh, thin blade which is connecting uh, the um, hull with the bulb. And bulb is this uh, heavy part of the boat. It's only five meters long, but it weighs um, 20 tons. And the total weight is 24 tons. So almost all the weight is concentrated in the bulb, 
and this is lead, pure lead, and is there to stabilize the boat, which otherwise would fly, right, under the action of, uh, of the wind, say. And then you have the famous winglets, which are there, and uh, they have multiple purposes that I'm not going to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to elaborate on uh, this evening, and, and this is the novelty introduced by, by the uh, uh, Australians in 1983. And, uh, and then you have the rudder, which is uh, one of the two allowed mobile parts of, of the boat, of the old boat. Of course, there are plenty of constraints here. And then you have sails, the main sail, and then the genoa, and, uh, and then in the, in the uh, downwind leg, uh, you have the spinnaker and the jennaker. Now, these are big sails. You can think of about 600 square meters of sails, right? Uh, so uh, there's a lot of energy induced by uh, the sail on the mast and then on the hull. So the hull should be extremely light but extremely resistant. Stiff, elastic, light, resistant, say. And um, um, the point is that when uh, engineers develop this boat, they try to understand precisely the limits, the operational limits, and be a little conservative going up by the 10% beyond the limit, but only 10%. Otherwise, you, the boats would be too heavy and they would never win. And um, so it's, it's a very risky game in some, in some sense. Well, so what mathematics has to, to do with that? Well, this is, the, uh, this is the picture. Again, it's a matter of modeling. You start from a concept, say a drawing made by an architect or, uh, or the, uh, the chief designer of the boat, say, and then you, you produce it by, in simple terms, by the CAD, computer assisted design, using uh, some, uh, let's say, few hundreds of surfaces to describe, small surfaces to describe the, uh, the old boat, say. Then you start from there, you have to generate a, a grid because you have sooner or later to go in finite dimensions. So again, here you'll see triangles and then tetrahedra or hexahedra. That's a very complex stuff that I'm not going to talk about. And then you can start solving equations and finding result. And these are the pressures on uh, the keel, the bulb, and uh, the wing, let's say. And, uh, and, and you see uh, whether or not engineers are happy and sailors are happy about performances of this boat. And if they're not happy, you have to subiterate until the very end when, uh, when you have a new design for a boat that you want to manufacture. Um, so this may take several months. And in the past campaign, it took us nine months before having the first design of the first boat, the first boat manufacturer, say. And, uh, and this is uh, the first boat that was manufactured in the, past, the last campaign, it's Swiss 1991, all right? Um, this is only the hull, and it's going to the ocean, say. And this is Swiss 100, uh, and, uh, and this is the one that won, actually. And once you have these two boats ready, uh, then they start competing uh, uh, each other and to train each other and you start measuring results, data, and seeing whether the prediction of your numerical tools or mathematical tools are correct. And, and you start improving the boat. You want to improve them, you are allowed to improve the shapes, and, uh, and you have car car carpenters and your people working day and night to modify the boat if necessary, right? Until when you are relatively confident and you have the final boat, say. Um, this is to give you the idea of this forces acting on the boat. Uh, there is a mass compression of about 50 tons. So this is why it's so easy to break this boat if you have, say, a wind, which is beyond the limits which are predicted. You start with uh, 10 knots, and you end up during the competition with 20 knots, and this is uh, putting the boat in, in, in jeopardy, actually. Um, this is uh, a synthesis of what happens. You go from the design to the actual simulation. So you could construct the geometry, then the grid, and then you simulate, and you have the pressure on the different components of the boat, and you can also predict, let's say, the turbulence on, on, on the sails. So um, this is what you do, and these are the equations that you have to solve. Again, I'm not going to, uh, to, uh, to, to explain the equation, but only I simply want to tell you what these equations uh, uh, mean, actually. You have uh, to solve the equations for the wind, so you are in the air phase, and then for the water, because you want to compute the flow around the appendages. First of all, the flow around the sails, and then the flow around the appendages. Uh, and then you have this water surface, which is not given. And this is part of the, uh, of the problem, of the unknown. So you have extra equations 
for this surface. So again, you have a couple of problems. You have the, the problem, the aerodynamic, the hydrodynamic of this interface, say. And, uh, and, and this is one simulation. This is the hull of America's Cup, the Alinghi hull, actually. It's 25 meters long, more or less. And this is the water surface, the, what mathematicians call the free surface. You have waves, and there are different colors which tells you the, uh, tell you the, the, the different elevation of, of the wave, say. Uh, this is a detail of the solution to show you how complex is the flow field around the appendages. This is the hull, right? This is the uh, keel, this is the bulb, and these are the winglets, and this is the rudder. And, and these are the streamlines, and you see the perturbation of the streamlines induced by the uh, uh, bulb and by the winglets. And in particular, you have to work on the shapes of all these elements in order to hopefully minimize the turbulence, but the, the, the general goal is to minimize the forces or the resistances that uh, are acting on the boat in order to improve uh, and increase the performance of the boat, say the speed of the boat. Um, and this is what you get when you look at sails at different levels. You have to compute the field around the sails, and here you have major recirculations and, and flow detachment and you want to minimize the, uh, the flow separation, actually. Again, working on the uh, different shapes of cells and also different consistency of cells, because, of cells. because if you make them more stiff, then uh, they will deform uh, less, and, uh, and therefore the flow field around the cells would be less perturbed. And uh, what you have done here has been to simulate the actual interaction, dynamic interaction between the flow field and the cells. The cells are deforming, and they are modifying the flow field, the flow field on its turn modify, exert different pressures on the cells which are deformed in a different manner. So we have to account for this, again, coupled fluid structure interaction. Like in the arteries. In the artery you have blood, which is a fluid, and you have the vessels, which are deforming, and here the, you have the same kind of mathematical equations. It's not the same kind of physics because these are completely different kind of fluids, blood and air, cells and, uh, and, uh, and uh, vessel walls. But the kind of equations are the same, say. And these are two uh, boats in competition. You have the one which is more red than the others. This is following because this is in, a, in, a, in the uh, downwind regime. So, uh, and, and, and you see the different colors that tell you the variations of the forces acting on the different components of the boat. So you have to know those kind of things if you want to end up with the optimal shape of the different components and therefore to end up with the uh, quote, quote, optimal or ideal boat, say, at the very, at the very end of the story. Uh, I want to give an idea of the uh, size of this problem, which is as far as uh, uh, we are concerned, our state of art in terms of complexity, uh, to simulate this uh, America's Cup uh, boat, a single boat, and at the very end, we have been simulating more than 400 different boats before ending up with uh, the one that was actually manufactured. Um, it took us about 24 hours on a multi-processor machine uh, which is capable of performing up to 10 to the power 16 operations. Operations mean uh, algebraic operations, so sum, sums or, or a multiplication, say. Uh, so 10 to the power 16. Um, and, uh, and, and you need as many as 160 millions of unknowns to uh, have those results. And uh, what, what, is, what are these unknowns? Well, they are the different values of the uh, vector field, the three components of the vector field in different points around the boat, and the different forces acting on the uh, different elements of the boat, the turbulence which is produced uh, everywhere, and the rate of dissipation of turbulence, say. So altogether, more than 160 million of unknowns to have this type of simulation for a single boat, say. So this was the happy hand, and this was uh, the cup. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, and, uh, and then I would like to show you, if, it's, if I have two more minutes, three more minutes, um, a movie which is taken from the, uh, not the last competition, but one before the last, the one in 2003. So you see real America's Cup in action, and you see the way flows are behaving. You see the, 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 the shape of the waterways and also the forces that are acting on the boat. I hope it works. Uh, there should be a sound. Is it okay? I hope it's okay. Yeah. So 
this is Alingi, and this is Black Magic, New Zealand. I think we can stop here, and uh, I think Galileo has a lot uh, to uh, had a lot to do with this uh, victory of Alinghi. Thank you very much for your patience, for your attention. So I wonder why they never have those close photo shots with the music behind it, showing the mathematicians computing the flows. <laughs> I'm going to open up the floor for questions, but before I do, I just want to point out that the fourth and final uh, lecture in our series will be just a few weeks away, Tuesday, March 4th. It's by Ivor Eklund, who is one of the world's greatest mathematical economists. And you heard a little bit about optimization in this uh, talk here, about how using mathematical models to make something better as fast as possible, as strong as possible, et cetera. And he's going to talk about the idea of optimization, tracing in history from the, from the Enlightenment to the current day where it rules such things as the economics of the Internet and how voting works and other things like that. If you take my word for it, it's going to be a great lecture. I hope you'll be there. And now, are there any questions for Professor Quartaroni? Canada 
in uh, uh, they used uh, the uh, wind tunnel uh, not only for sales but also for the packages and uh, and the towing tank and both were in Canada one is in Newfoundland because you need sufficiently big uh, operational facilities uh, and, and the other one was in Ottawa um, in the towing tank uh, uh, you scale to the ratio of one to three actually so you build up a model which is one third of the actual model uh, this is basically because of the fact that uh, when you put it in a towing tank uh, uh, you start agitating the water and you have uh, a bad reflection for waves from the walls so uh, if your boat is too big then uh, walls are too uh, close and uh, you have resonance uh, that you can then uh, 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 I mean eliminate basically so uh, they built up a hull which is uh, of 8 meters long and they did experiments around that and with sales, the, um, the actual ratio is super linear. So for, for sales, uh, which are 30 meters high, you have to go up to 30, uh, 1.3, so basically 40 meters high. Uh, because again, in the matter of scaling, and, uh, with these type of ratios, you know how to scale to get the right parameters. But this is a very critical point. But what I would like to mention here is the fact that this experimental side uh, is used only for, at the very early stage, first of all, only for one single shape, and we use them, use the results, the data that were measured to validate our model. The first model had to uh, respond correctly to those data, and then we use the model for as many as, as was mentioned before, 400 different configurations, for which you didn't have any uh, wind tunnel uh, test or towing tank test. On the other side, when you have these uh, boats manufactured, then they start playing uh, training, uh, and then you can get real data from, from, from real measures. But at the very early stage, you absolutely need, absolutely need an experimental mm -hmm. facility to, uh, to end up with uh, parameterization, and this is very important for the validation of the numerical model. There's a question way in the back. I wonder, in your modeling, have you ever found something that uh, was quite unexpected, say some vortex in an unexpected place, and then you wonder how that happened, and if you ever seen it again, I mean, in a reality? Uh, I think, think about it, something that you predict in the model and you don't expect it. And yeah, uh, well, uh, when, when you talk about biological flows, this is the everyday practice of portrait says that uh, it's so hard to predict correctly what's happening that it's, uh, there's plenty of surprises. So uh, in, in, the, in the other business, uh, when I talk about, for instance, uh, in long engineering, it's a different story because these models are already fairly optimized. So what you are really doing is trying to use more sophisticated mathematics uh, to get better accuracy. But the better accuracy is the only 1%. Mm -hmm. And it's estimated that uh, if you can improve by 1%, if you can reduce by 1%, the viscous resistance of the hull, you can have an advantage of up to 30 seconds on the finish line, which is very often is more than enough to win. Right? So in those cases, uh, it's more difficult to find something which is completely unexpected. On the other hand, very often uh, you find something which is somehow against the intuition. For instance, in this uh, movie, um, Black Magic, the New Zealand team was playing with uh, this uh, famous aura that, that they used. Aura was a kind of uh, extended uh, hull that they used in order to gain velocity in, uh, in the uh, narrowing leg. And uh, it was absolutely intuitive that this would have been a very innovative and, uh, and, 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 and successful uh, modification. But indeed, this is not the case. And because, I mean, it was much faster in the downwind leg, but maneuvering was much more difficult. Do. And actually, it happened that we tried the Wola, this appendage, uh, much earlier than the race on the computer. And we found out that what, we had problems. And this is what, why we disregarded it. So we use a more conventional design for, for the hardware and power. So sometimes the intuition uh, plays against the reality. But not because you have something which is totally unexpected, but because when you want to innovate, and to make sure that 
uh, innovation in the design that correspond to real improvement in, in, in performances. Peter? To your knowledge, did other teams also use computational modeling in their design? And if so, what factors uh, do you think most contributed to you outperforming them in design? Aha, uh -huh, that's difficult. Okay, the first, the first part of our question is easy to answer. Yes, all the teams are using computational fluid dynamics, and in particular Oracle, I know for sure, and I also know some people in uh, universities in, uh, in the West Coast uh, who have been working for, for Oracle, and, uh, and uh, Luna Rossa, the Italian team, and the New Zealand team, and the, um, the Swedish team, so most of them are using uh, computational fluid dynamics. Um, I have also to say that until uh, uh, the uh, 2000 uh, race, um, there were basically no Navistox equations involved in, uh, in these computations. Uh, people used uh, potential models, uh, where you linearize everything basically and, uh, and you disregard the uh, rotational components of the flow field. And this was the state of art until 2000. Say. In 2003, we used, together with uh, New Zealand and Oracle, I think for the first time, uh, Navistox equations to simulate the flow field. And I guess, uh, and, and, and this time, the major, uh, I would say, improvement that we had in our simulation was from one side with a much better tool to simulate the free surface, the waterway, which is much less disruptive than, than, than what you can get with commercial code. And, uh, and on the other side, I think we have been the first to simulate the actual dynamics of, of the sails. I mean, the interaction between the air and the sails. And, and this is very important, I think, because you have major uh, changes in the flow field. And, uh, and, and this is important to then reconstruct the actual performances on the boat. Um, of course, it's very difficult to quantify uh, the way this has been contributing to the uh, to the actual final success. Boris, um, you, you, I, I would like to go back to the issue of validation. Uh, you talked Please, about the issue of validation. validation. Right. You talked about validation at the beginning of your talk, and uh, you would not agree more. And then there was some discussion about validation before. I'm curious, how exactly have you validated those computations? For instance, uh, you presented results from very complex problems, whether one deals with problems in the human body, where at Reynolds numbers in the physiologic range, the flow transitions to terminus and get fine scales that are important for the biology that occurs the blood cells. Uh, and to go to the America's Cup, the Reynolds numbers are very high, the separation are massive, very highly unsteady phenomena, and the unsteady vortices produce most of the terminus actually. And these are phenomena that are hard to predict with statistical equations. So I was wondering to what extent, when you talk about validation, can tell us a little bit how you have validated and what aspects of the computation you have validated? Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, these are completely different issues. I mean, when you are in a blood flow, is one story. When you are in America's Cup, is a totally different story. Uh, so for America's Cup, the goal that we had was to try to match the experimental data, the actual measures that they make in a very sophisticated manner on the, on the, on the water plan uh, at the 1% uh, of accuracy. Uh, what kind of measures? Well, they can measure velocities in specific places or, uh, or, 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 or the uh, position of vorticity, specific vortices, or the separation between, uh, sorry, the transition between lambda and thermal flows. Those kind of things. I mean, they know very well how to measure and to detect that, and they asked us to be accurate enough to predict those type of things. This is another condition that we, 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 we made. You match this thing within 1%? Yes. This is the target that we had in this past competition, this past campaign. Um, and, um, uh, and this is why to, 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 to strive so much with turbulence models, for instance. We are correctly mentioning the way of the use of statistical models that we did not use, actually. We played with very many uh, deterministic models, turbulence models, very, very many. And eventually pick up the one that was more uh, successful. And, but this allowed us to match that, that, that goal. Now, when I talk about biological flows, uh, it's a totally different story in the sense that there you really do not, I think it's not fair to say that you want to uh, get the first, or second, or third significant digit. You're very far away from that. Uh, here you want to reproduce some qualitative behaviors. And sometimes, you have uh, recorded that, for instance, the pressure profiles 
a different section of the hour or in different places. Those type of comparison you can do and you try to uh, tune up your model in order to be produce those kind of things. But these are very specific and I would say not kind of information. There is nothing concerning uh, matching uh, velocity field in a point-wise manner and nowhere in the body. This is far too complicated. And I would also say that it's not even meaningful because, I mean, body reacts in a different manner under different conditions and the metabolic response it can change. So it's not uh, an amorphous material. Uh, it's not like computing the lift or the drag on, 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 the, uh, on the wing of an airphone, right? Uh, they are really at these principles and they are invariant to uh, uh, external conditions. Set. I think in blood flow or in medicine in general, uh, what you can uh, reasonably assess is for instance the uh, performance of one prosthetic implant with respect to another prosthetic implant. You have a bypass in one way or another way, then you can tell the doctor this is definitely better than the other one. Uh, or uh, you can say that uh, uh, when you are considering different kind of stiffness in the artery, you have the pressure pulse which changes in one way or in another way and uh, you can provide quantitative uh, information and you can rely on that. Uh, but I think we are far away from uh, providing answers which are quantitatively uh, certified. Okay. Well, I want to thank Professor Parvati again.